Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this headlunch talk. So we have two speakers today. Uh, first, we have our guest, Darren White. He's visiting us from the uh, UK, and he was a PhD student at the University of Sheffield. Currently, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Warwick. And, uh, and he will tell us about, well, about gravitational waves, so pick up pull up during advanced LIGO field work. Uh, and after that, after this talk, we will follow up, we will follow with uh, Cecilia Garapo, who is also a postdoctoral researcher at High Energy, and she will tell us about stars, right? Okay, Sarah, yeah, please. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so, as I said, I'm, I'm coming to visit from the University of Warwick, where I'm a postdoc working on uh, EM follow-up during a fast slide of uh, Hey, Darren, speak up a little louder. Sorry? It's, hard, it's hard in the back of the you hear me okay? Um, so, I did my PhD at Sheffield, where the work I'm doing at work now is basically a continuation of what I was doing at Sheffield. Um, while Sheffield, I used the Liverpool Telescope and Roxy Array of Telescopes to do EM yeah, follow-up, uh, but we realised that both had some weaknesses that we could hopefully try and fix with a new telescope, which I'm going to talk about towards the end of the talk. Um, the, the advanced LIGO detector, the two detectors in the US, are going to get switched on later this year with Virgo following the year after. Um, we hope, well, we expect that the, uh, these advanced detectors will provide the first, hopefully, many gravitational wave detectors. Um, the reason why we expect them quite soon is because we have a 10 fold increase of distance of LIGO, compared, <coughs> advanced LIGO compared to the initial LIGO. So the little orange circle in the middle is what initial LIGO could do. Uh, we've had previous runs where we did some essentially testing of the yeah, follow-up campaigns. If we saw something great, but we didn't expect it. But with the new detectors, when they reach the design sensitivity, we're going to see a thousand times more in volume. Um, so obviously greatly increases our chances of detection. Um, my own personal interest is in gravitational transients and their EM counterparts. Um, these are the kind of sources which are transient in gravitational waves and produce electromagnetic sources as well. Um, my area of research is primarily on CBC, compact binary coalescence or um, compact binary merger systems. So neutron stars and on black holes merge together. Um, we think that neutron star neutron star mergers are the, the, one of the progenitors of short GRBs. Um, so if we can compare uh, a gravitational wave signal to a short GRB, then that's a, a nice one. Yeah. But it's a little bit more difficult because short GRBs are well, there, well outside the range of LIGO limit. So we, how we do this could be a, a bit different. The, reason, the, the other reason uh, these are important is it's normally neutral star neutral star mergers that are used as the, um, the, the, the metric for saying how well the detectors are doing and what their sensitivity is. They normally list um, a distance range to an average uh, merger. So if you see some of the detectors can see out to 50 megaparsecs, it's that they can detect an average similar, average kind of uh, neutral star merger out to 50 megaparsecs. Um, so because these are expected to be the first sources we detect, this is, tends to be the one that's used to, to discuss what the detector sensitivity is like. So to do EM follow, it's, it's, it's quite a few steps involved. <coughs> This has been the same since the initial run that we did a few years ago. So, this comes in, goes to the computer centers, and runs through a series of pipelines, depending on what sources they're looking for. Sent to a database, then you've got another set of pipelines which look for the ones that are most interesting to what kind of telescopes they're using. The triggers normally decided at this stage based on what their false alarm rate is, which is some kind of measurement of significant power or the threshold from the background events. So you say something's got a, a false alarm rate of 1 in 40 days, it would mean that within those 40 days you will see a similar signal purely from the random noise in the detectors. Um, these can, what, what telescopes can choose to do is pick which events to follow up based on their false alarm rate. So if you've got a telescope where you only have a few hours of observation set aside, you go for the, the, the lowest false alarm rate, so you go for the ones that are very rare, whereas if you've got something that can do observations day after day, you'll probably go for as much as 
many different things that you can possibly do. Um, as I said, the, uh, the, the range of LIGO's that's design sensitivity is going to be a factor of 10 distance, but that's not going to happen straight away. Um, as the detectors are sort of starting to go through super periods of maintenance to improve the sensitivity, so at the end of this year, um, probably still looking at about 54 <coughs> megaparsecs in terms of what the distance range is. The next year, hopefully double that, and then keep going to keep going until we reach the design sensitivity. The exact timeline depends on how, how well things work. We won't know until we switch them off completely and try them in the science mode. Um, Virgo, like I said, is probably going to come along in 2016 for the first one, with a much, not, not necessarily much shorter business rate, but not as comparable as LIGO, purely because it's running behind and it's, it's a short of uh, arm length as well. So that's something to uh, be wary of there. Hopefully, the first one. This could actually be a little bit higher, possibly twice what the initial level of sensitivity was. Um, with that evolving sensitivity, you get actually a change in what the sky maps are going to look like. So these blue arcs are typical sky maps uh, of uh, neutral star mergers placed in these patches on the sky. Um, and you can see that some regions you're just not going to be able to get a good localization all the way crosses. Um, as you get further and further, it depends on what the, the, the texts are doing. Um, they can get better, they can get longer. It, it's, it's quite variable across the sky for any one trigger. Hopefully, in the early 2020, you're going to have a fourth detector in India, which will help the localization quite a lot, but that's quite a while away. So, before that, you're going to have these big error regions where you need to search to look for uh, a, a gravitational wave signal, depending on where the sky comes from. So, that's a big challenge. Um, an example using uh, simulated data is, is this. So you can see you've got this, this single trigger. This is the original location. You've got these massive arcs that go across nearly all the entire sky. So we need to be able to tile as much of this as possible per trigger. That's a big ask, because these are several minutes square of these, if not more. If you get this, oh, sorry, sure I'm sorry, this is just Hanford and Livingston. These are just the two uh, American detectors. Once you throw in Virgo, um, if you get a detection all three, you get a much smaller error region, which is useful. But you need to have a detection all three detectors to get this kind of uh, sky map. If you have something, even if Virgo is running, if your signal comes from something that's outside of Virgo's range, you're going to go back to the original map, which is this big arc across the sky, which is also why a third detector, so a fourth detector, a third LIGO detector in India would be useful, but again, quite uh, Long way off. So, even with the uh, this is still quite a big area. You're not going to be able to do it with something like the telescope. You need something that's got quite a wide field of view. Um, so, not only do we have big readers to look at, we also need to figure out what we're looking for. So, we have a bunch of models and detections. So, the, the, the colored solid lines are um, optical afterglows. Uh, of short GRBs for some models, um, and then the squares are detections and blue triangles are limits. And you can see that they, they, they fit the models pretty well. Uh, but this is if you're looking on axis at uh, a short GRB. If you look off axis, then it can be instead. So these are going to be very difficult to see with most telescopes. So a lot of effort, a lot of interest switched to this grey area, the colour of So you have um, Neutron rich material is thrown off during the merger, they go to decay, lots of light in there. So these models looked perfect for what we're looking for, but more recently they've changed uh, using more advanced capacities. So you went from these kind of light curves for different bands to this. So the, the blue of the optical and uh, red are suppressed and it's more in the near infrared. <coughs> so doing optical follow up was looking very difficult as well. Um, so these are timescales of a few days up to a week. Uh, we got kind of a bit of proof that this, these may work. So we found a single detection, a near infrared excess in GRB 13.603b. And the hash region here is the, the range of models from the, the same paper that the, the previous slide shows came from. So that, that's quite a nice fit. Um, so, people that were doing an optical follow-up, like me, we saw that, and well, that's the most, it's a lot more difficult. But, 
not necessarily. There's still more models going on, there's still more coming out. Um, very recently, um, we, we have some models which say that in the early stages of the merger, the, the, the jet is still optically thin, so you can have quite a bit of heat in the material and you can get a lot of blue and optical light out as well. So if you the, the, the dash lines are kind of, kind of the similar colour only without if you, if you don't take into account uh, the early stages of uh, <coughs> neutral heating. And then if you do, you could get some blue and uh, optical black colours as well. Very short time scale for a, a, a few hours. So if we do an optical follow up, we need something to cover, cover a big region of the sky and we get there in a few hours. So you need something that's got a wide field and we go down to fake magnitudes, which there's not that many around that we have for uh, available to do this. So, so just give you a quick overview of the different kind of progenitors, uh, remnants, and what what kind of light you can get out. You can see that quite likely you get a pillar of them, all of them, but in some cases you can also get quite a, a bright blue component that all depends on whether the, the the pair of neutral stars uh, merged to use a high superstar, which then collapsed to a black hole, or you've got uh, a, a black hole that's been the arm, that helps as well. So it's, the, the optical counterparts are quite uncertain, so part of it is we want to search for everything to try and test the models against observations, see if we can see anything like this, and place up limits if we have to. Um, so that's what I've used is <coughs> a bunch of simulations for the first two years of the advanced LIGO burger. So again, similar the same plot before, we've got these simulations for these massive star maps. Um, this gives us an indication of what the detection capabilities of the LIGO Virgo system will be. Um, we need to be so we need to be able to kind of not only search this entire region but get there fast if we want to try and catch the the blue the, 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 the LIGO. <coughs> So these simulations, there's pushing 1,300 different sky maps, different events, so different masses of neutral stars, different orientations, parts of the sky, etc. So quite a few to deal with. Um, they look to what your this like a cumulative histogram. So if you want to, um, if you search out to 100 square degrees of every single sky map, you're only going to catch about half. The other half will be the, the, the outer regions, so you've got to, even if you have something to be able to do on the square degrees, you've got a fixed shooting chance to find it. So you need to be able to hopefully get up to a few hundred square degrees, and that's difficult. Um, just to give you an example of what the uh, simulations look like in terms of <coughs> distance ranges, you see some of them in sort of the purple points are for 2015 cells, which is just uh, Hanford and Livingston in America. So you've got the See, there's, there's a dependence on orientation because if you've got the two merging system that's face on towards the detectors, that gives you um, there's more gravitational, the, the gravitational waves are stronger, so you can see further there. That's basically what it is. There's also some variation on where it is in the sky as well, which is why some of the you see there's still some grey points down here which we don't have detected, but they may just be in the point in the sky which is just not detectable. Um, you see, in 2016, if you're very lucky, you get something that's face on, you can go beyond 200 meter parsec, which, again, makes it very difficult to see. So hopefully, with it face on, you'll get quite a lot of the, the prompt uh, afterglow from the short, uh, short GRB, but we're not entirely certain. So, we need to be able to kind of search for this range in general in terms of distance. Um, to kind of emphasize how spread out the, um, the scanups are. Just a plot of distance in degrees from the highest probability likelihood on the, on the sky map to where the true source location is. So, the vast majority are within a couple of a few tens of degrees, but some of them are still all the way out to 100 square 180 degrees which is on the other side of the star. So, you could be completely in the wrong place. If you just go for the brightest stuff, you may completely go miss all of this. So you need to be careful about how you're going to search these sky maps as well. Not just be able to cover it, but how you do it. Um, 2016 gets a bit better with, uh, with Virgo. 
we get a lot more within 10 degrees, but we still get some that are all the way out. So it's difficult. You know, we need to reach about 20th magnitude to cover a good portion of the distance range, cover large areas of the sky quickly, and there's not many facilities that can do that uh, at the minute that's able to do this repeatedly and often for the amount of trigger you're going to get out of uh, advanced scenario. So what we did, Warwick and Sheffield, um, using uh, yeah, Warwick and Monash universities in Monash in, the, in Australia, uh, they have LICE, which helps with funding for internal projects. Sheffield, Leicester, and MR as well, joined the collaboration. It's entirely internally funded. Um, it's uh, a, a wide field, deep optical telescope. So each of these astrographs, uh, 40 centimeter mirrors, in the original design was uh, about <coughs> 3 square degrees per astrograph. Uh, the mount itself can hold up to eight. Um, we've actually been looking at possibly getting better CCDs. So not only do we have a better uh, QE, but we have a larger field view, possibly up to double per astrograph. So instead of being 3 square degrees, 3 square degrees goes up to about 6. Still working on that, not entirely sure, we'll waiting for some of the, uh, the information to come back from the people who are manufacturing these. But we should be able to do better than what we're about to show now, just how the simulations are yet. Um, so it's going to be a phased system. So later this year, we're going to have uh, this version set up, which is just the middle four actual refs. So uh, 11.6 square degrees per tile. That's 21st mag in five minute observation. First light later this year, in time for hopefully the first observing of the glider. That <coughs> should be starting around September time. Um, we've got an MOU in place. We, we can get triggers from the, the flood direct from LIGO. Um, we can also possibly send out alerts to, if we see something interesting, go to Google Telescope or something like that to do further follow up and find anything really interesting. Um, the reason why we're doing the prototype phase is so we can check that everything that we've covered, because this is, is a surprisingly cheap set, um, but we, st we still expect to be able to get good science out of it, but we still want to be able to test it. If everything works as well as we hope, we can then add on further ones with extra, bit, with extra funding. Um, possibly even doing a second mount in La Palma as well, because we've got this relocated. And <coughs> if that works as well, even a, a southern node in Australia, so we can get a full sky coverage we'll go to. And also work in synoptic mode, so we scan the sky, so we've got reference templates, we can search for anything variable over long time scales. So it's, it's quite a useful quality. <coughs> to give you an idea of where it's going to be, if you've been to the harbor, so this is Super Wasp, which is also run by Warwick, so a lot of the computing will be in there. The link go to is going to go here, so we've got local telescope, IT, and WHD, which is also useful. We're going to hopefully do reduction in real time, so if we see anything interesting, we can should be able to send off alerts to any other telescopes at that time pretty quickly <coughs> to follow any interesting candidates on our telescopes. We'll see how that goes. Just a, an alert mock up. That's what it should look like once it's built. Uh, that's Super Wasp. I can't remember the name of these two telescopes. I think it's maybe the Warwick one week as well. So, yeah, get an idea of what it's going to look like. The reason why we picked the father is not just because Super Wasp is <coughs> useful, but in terms of what the sky maps look like, you can see that the region of Oakland Harbour is very well suited for the smaller sky maps, the quick follow-ups. So if, you, if we were, say, in Chile, that's going to give you several hundred square meters to look at. That's what we're getting for. If we get something over La Palma, it's middle of the night, we can sort of straight away within half an hour, hopefully, maybe an hour, and then just keep tallying over the small patch of sky as quickly as possible. But we can also just wait for the, the nice guys to rotate around, and we'll probably still get a lot of this as well. So that's part of what I've been doing is working out the best way of, of how to tie up this guy up so we can get the, the most probability out of the finding the right source. To give you an idea of what the tiles actually look like on a sky map. So this is with the original prototype design, which is uh, three square degrees per astrograph, four astrographs on uh, METs. So this is what the sky map looked like for one of those first two year simulations. You can see the, the, the tiling algorithm tries to cover the sky map as well as possible with the least amount of uh, overlap. 
um, so get the fewest amount of times for the time. <coughs> um, if we do end up having double the list <coughs> size per tile, uh, we can do another thing quite a, a better one. But we'll see what happens with the, the design result. We, we, we could possibly be between 15% more to double. I'm not sure yet. Um, in terms of what this means for actual follow up, these simulations not only give the sky maps but the actual true location of their injections. So the majority are actually within 20 to 30 uh, <coughs> tiles. So if you get five minutes per tile, you're looking at a couple of hours, three hours to find the right location, which is perfect for the short length of looking for them. It means the majority, if, if, if these simulations are what we get from LIGO, we should be able to see the, the, um, <coughs> the correct location. And if the, if the models are correct, we're going to be there in time to catch the early blue component. So that's perfect for what we want. Um, if we <coughs> go from the bigger design, actually, I should say go to one, so that, um, even better, we get more than a few tiles. Uh, 2016, with, with Virgo, you, you get much better. You can do it sometimes in one or two tiles. Um, some of them still need quite a few, but these are the ones where you just they're very low signal to noise, lots of stuff going on. Um, it, it can be quite hard to find these even with go to, but the majority should be easily visible. Um, yeah, this is where if we have the, the, the uh, bigger detectors in 2016, even if we're just using four astrographs, um, so it can be even better if we have eight astrographs that are double the size, and if this will all keep shifting down. Um, so th this is all stuff that needs to come soon. Um, these will also do, yeah, these will with the original specs. Um, what's, what's also interesting is the, the, the sky maps, the, the, the cumulus and histogram I showed you earlier, that that gave you the, the, the an, an idealized searching of the error, the error region in terms of the contour. But that's not necessarily what you do with the telescope. If you've got a wide field telescope that becomes a big patch of the sky map at once, what the, the, the fraction that you search of the pro uh, fra fraction of the probability that you search with the telescope can actually be a lot higher in terms of before you find the source. So basically, what I'm trying to show this is it's not necessarily a good idea to go automatically uh, for the, uh, the, the set for the, the brightest pixels in the center region, you want to work your way out. Um, you don't want to stop right and work your way out. You're more likely to find if you um, look at the, the, the highest, um, probably the, the lowest probability region, sorry. Um, so you should not necessarily go for um, the brightest region, but maybe just try and tile as much as possible. So if you've got a whole nice observing, you, you just want to start on low because how tile is best you can not start in the second working way right Does that make sense? Yeah, same thing again just with 2016. You still have a lot of the tiles uh, you, you need to go out to 67% of your own total probability before you find the source. So going for the, the, the central time is possibly not a good idea. Um, yeah, again, even a larger field of view, same thing happens. So it's, it's, you, you can't necessarily, you need to be careful about when you talk about search areas for these. It, if it says 100 square degrees, that's fine. But how your telescope actually searches that 100 square degrees is a different matter. So it's, it's, it's important to have a look at this. When you come to doing follow up campaigns, you need to look at how your telescope responds respond to this. Um, yeah. So your distance from the center fix is too large, but the contours themselves don't necessarily relate to what your telescope can do. Um, I'd like to point out as well, uh, I did a quick back in the end look kind of calculation as well. And I said the, the color node graphic loads with the 2015 setup, we should be able to see between 50 and 60% of the color node based on their actual distances and what the 
is the moment we've had So that's also very good. Once it gets to 2016, it drops off quite a lot. But if we have that distance with the original CCDs, the newer CCDs got better quantum efficiency, especially in the red. So we could possibly increase that as well. Um, so yeah, that's a quick summary. We've got <coughs> fancy Texas coming soon. Uh, in follow up is exciting, but it's also challenging. Um, Go to use very cost effective um, follow up facility. It's very competitive, we can deploy it quickly as well. It's scalable, so we can expand it out or change the shape of the detectors. So, if you saw those eight uh, scopes on the map, you can actually point them together so they overlap perfectly with the other telescopes. So, you can do um, multi color observations at the same time. You can stack images to get a better um, magnitude. Uh, quite flexible in terms of field of view mapping, so it's should be quite good. Um, data analysis is something that we're working on as well. Real time reduction and classification is going to be difficult, but it's something we're, we're confident we can do. Um, on top of that, it's, it's going to be standard, the nice guy, so we're going to be doing tiny main astrophysics, fast transients, looking at uh, X ray, gamma ray transients, radio events. It's, it's going to be able to harvest anything. So, initially designed for uh, Rotation wave follow up, <coughs> but it's good for a lot of things. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have some time for questions. Yeah, right. uh, when you find a transient in that kind of sky area, what is the chance actually that that transient is like, could be something else? Like, I mean, how are you sure that it really is the gravitational wave? Yeah, that's the whole classification thing. That's, that's different. Um, we, we haven't done those simulations yet. All these simulations are based on the tile the correct location where we know the, the injection comes from. Because the next step is can we figure, can we really distinguish a gravitational wave related to optical counterpart based on its, its light curve, its white type, that kind of thing. There's been some work done that involves colours. Whether we can use colours with filter or not, we've got filter wheel, but initially I think we're just going to go for white light just to test that everything's working. As I said, we could overlap the detectors so we could do uh, coincident multicolor observations of different filters. We'll see how it goes. That's the whole point of it being adaptable and scalable, is so that we can, as, as things evolve, as we understand how it works better, we, we, we're still going to be able to be competitive. It's not a case that we stick it on and then if, it, if we can't figure it out, it's a bust. We've got lots of things we can do with it to maximize our chances. Okay, we have a question. Or using priors in your search strategy, like galaxy catalogs, or how good the yeah. are for each other? Um, so, the problem with these first two years simulations is they're completely random on the sky. They're not lined up with any galaxies. So, if, if I do a search into the galaxy catalog, there's no guarantee of their injection but lies with the galaxy. So, we get our worst case scenario. And then there's the best case if I inject the brightest galaxy at a similar distance. I've done something like that, and we actually drop in terms of how many. So it's actually better to just go for a whole sky map coverage. Because there's, there's some, in terms of how the, the sky map works, if, if you have the worst case scenario, is, is, is pretty bad compared to just having the entire sky map. And if we can do the entire sky map anyway, we might as well, because we'll be able to find a lot of other things. I think Galaxy catalogs are useful for things that have got a small field of view, um, but the, the Galaxy catalogs don't extend out beyond that. Parties in a minute. So you're gonna to, to lose a lot um, of galaxies, you're just gonna be missing a lot of galaxies in your catalog. So once you get to 250 parsecs, it's gonna be difficult for that reason as well anyway. Okay, so last question. Hope it's quick. Uh, so you, you said that you're gonna be doing what like operations? Originally, yeah. And what's your uh, pixel scale gonna be? Uh, I was about four point five parsecs. It's basically gonna be uh, a single pixel. A point source is going to be in the same way. So that's another thing we need to be able to do with, but quite confident we'll be able to. Okay, so thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And we continue with Cecilia, who will tell us about magnetic complexity and stellar spin down. In a second. Take it something to do with my I can go in there. 
about magnetic complexity and stellar spin down. Oh. <laughs> okay, this doesn't work. I am being. It does work. Okay, then we move the computer this way. Okay. Yes. <laughs> here. Okay, so one of the most fundamental observable characteristics of a star is its rotation, and it's also one that we can measure to great precision. However, um, the field of rotation evolution of a star is still highly unsatisfactory. And unlike the, the stellar evolution theory that predicts much with, uh, with a few ingredients, this is quite the opposite. It needs a lot of ingredients and, and cannot even explain the rotational history of the sun. Lately, um, there was a lot of, so the field regained a lot of interest, as we can see from the citation history of, of the seminal paper by Skumanich. Um, so, increasing a lot, and this is thanks to involved improved observations of stellar rotation periods, and also uh, improved observations of the magnetic surface surface structures on the on the stars that are the, the visible symptoms of the stellar rotation. And also, on the other hand, it has regained interest. Because uh, magnetic activity and stellar rotation became very important in many contexts. For example, exoplanetary environments. So in the exoplanetary environments, it's important what the, what the whole star's magnetic activity is. Because even if usually habitability of planets is defined in terms only of the distance of the planet <laughs> to the star, uh, the distance at which these planets can have liquid water on the surface, in the case of m dwarfs, for example, that are uh, probably the most promising uh, targets to find um, planets in the habitable zone, these, these zones are very close to the host star. And therefore, they could be uh, exposed to very extreme atmospheric conditions that depend on the magnetic activity of the star. This plot, for example, shows a steady state um, simulation of three planets. Uh, orbiting an M dwarf, and uh, that's the orbital plane, and the contour, the color contours show the um, the stellar wind pressure, like dynamical pressure, and it's um, normalized to the to the one we suffer in the Earth from the the typical wind from from the sun that we suffer in the, in the Earth, and you can see that these planets have to go through. Um, areas of very high, this is, goes up to, I don't know if you see, 1,000 times the, the dynamical pressure that, that we experience here in the, in the Earth. And so in the context of, of these kind of planets that orbit M dwarfs, the habitability will also depend on many other factors than just the distance. For example, well, the, the wind pressure, the coronal mass ejections pressure, the magnetic field of the planet that could potentially protect the star from the, um, from the winds and for, from the atmosphere uh, from being stripped off. And also from the, it will depend also on the amount of radiation, UV and X-ray radiation that the planets are exposed to that could result in atmospheric evaporation. Um, okay, so magnetic activity is also relevant in the context of cataclysmic variables. Because the orbital and mass transfer evolution of, of, this, of these systems um, is governed by angular momentum loss, both the um, gravitational rotation, uh, radiation, sorry, and, and via magnetized winds. So the gravitational and radiation of these systems is, is well understood. And Darren can correct me on that, but I think it is. And, but the, there's still no 
um, good theory for the spin down of these models in the regime were, were magnetic breaking, the, so the, the angular momentum loss through magnetized winds dominates. That is uh, about three hours period, so about the CV period gap. And usually, it's um, it's assumed that, that these systems follow the same prescription for angular momentum loss via magnetized winds as, as just a single star, the late, the late type star would, and neglect and assuming a dipolar field on it and neglecting completely the, the companion. But the white dwarfs, for example, can have fields ranging up to 10 to the 8 Gauss, and this is probably going to affect the magnetic structure of the it will it will bend and, and change the, the wind structure of the of the late companion. And this so Cohen et al. found actually that that the um, orbit the, the orbital evolution and the magnetic uh, accretion are both dependent on both on the both stars magnetic fields and the relative orientation of them. And they even show that for all the same parameters, just by a flip on the magnetic field or of the M dwarf, this is an M dwarf and a Y dwarf, and a y dwarf. Just by a flip on the magnetic field of the M dwarf that would happen over a, a magnetic cycle, you can get the accretion to be turned on and off. And of course, it's important in the context of gyrocanology, which is the, um, the idea of using stellar rotation as an H indicator. So for that, we need to understand stellar rotation. And Open clusters are a very powerful um, way of understanding or studying stellar rotation because they provide with a coeval uh, group of stars that then we can characterize by mass or spectral type. And observations of, of open clusters have revealed a color period uh, relation that depends, of course, on for, for each cluster for different ages. It changes, but if one could calibrate this relation, using different clusters of different ages, one could get the single surface relation between spectral type, spectral type, age, and rotation period. And recently, um, Maimon et al. Uh, found this, the, provided the, the observations of this period color relation for a cluster of 2.5 billion years that is breaching the gap, the previously existing gap between the open clusters that were have been observed before that were very young and our own sun. However, for younger stars, the, the story is a bit more complicated and it's not also low behaved. Um, so this plot shows the um, rotation, the, the angular velocity as a function of age of solar, solar type stars of different clusters, open clusters observations. And notice that this is a logarithmic scale, so this is the spread. So at very young ages, stars have a spread in rotation periods that are probably reflecting just the original uh, dispersion in, in, in spin. And then they, they pretty much stay with the same period while they have a disk. And when the disk is dispersed, they spin up because they're still contracting and they're free to spin up until they reach the zero age main sequence where they start losing um, angular momentum. And they lose angular momentum because they have magnetized winds that co-rotate with them, carrying away mass uh, and so so the mass goes, the plasma goes through the winds, and when it reaches uh, the, the velocity, the alpha velocity, it gets disconnected from the star. And that point, um, the collection of all the points where this happens is, is called the alpha surface. And we can think of it as a surface that divides the inside of which everything is rotating together and outside of which things are disconnected from the star. And that gives a good lever arm to, to lose angular momentum much more efficiently than if you would be losing mass just from stellar surface. So, okay, so that's magnetic breaking and to, to calculate uh, how much angular momentum a star is losing, one would have to know then um, what the density and velocity of the plasma is at each point of this open surface 
and of course the shape and size of the atom's surface. And so there's many ingredients that go to play, but that's a very popular uh, first order approximation given by Weber and James in 67 that is assuming spherical symmetry and split monopole. And it's still very much used, but is a very simplified version. But anyway, all these ingredients go into play. And however, after enough time, <coughs> one billion years or so, the rotation periods of all the stars of the same spectral type converge to a, to a unique function that depends only, in, uh, only on age. And that's when we, we can think of gyrochronology. But what still remains a mystery is this big dispersion of two orders of magnitude or so of younger magnetically active stars. Furthermore, for those problematic stars, uh, observations of open clusters show that there's a bimodal distribution in the rotation periods. So here I'm showing two open clusters observations, the period and the spectral type. And of ages 150 and 220 million years. And you can clearly see that there's two branches that are called C and I from convective and interface, but I won't get into the details of why. And as you go uh, as you go later in age of open clusters, if you look at observations of, of older open clusters, what happens is that this C branch gets less and less populated and all the stars transition to the I branch, eventually getting them all in the I branch, and again, it will behave in general chronology, etc. Um, so there, was, there have been many attempts to explain this in terms of, so if you have a very sudden change in the angular, in the, in the spin of the star, you can blame it on, on the moment of inertia or on a change of, of angular momentum. So there's been many attempts to, to explain this by a sudden change in the moment of inertia, because these stars have a convective envelope and a radiative core, and by allowing them to couple and decouple, you get a, a, a sudden change in the moment of inertia, and therefore a sudden change in the, in the rotation period of the stars. For example, if you let the, the convective envelope if you allow it to decouple at one point, then the, the winds will be much more efficient than at removing angular momentum from, from the part that we can actually see of the star. So you will see that out of the blue, they're spinning down super fast. It's just because of that. But all these attempts, uh, however, have not been very uh, successful at reproducing the observations of all these clusters. Instead, uh, Brown focused on the on the angular momentum part of, of, of the equation. So he, he explains this by a sudden change instead of in the moment of inertia on the angular momentum, proposing a, a scenario that is called metastable, that's what it is, I do right, but metastable dynamo model, that it's a unifying spin down, down scenario that is very successful at reproducing the open cluster uh, observations. And in this scenario, Stars are born with, um, with their magnetic dynamos in a mold that couple very weakly to the, to the stellar field, to the stellar winds. And therefore they cannot, um, they cannot lose, they don't lose angular momentum in an efficient way because they're not coupled to the mechanism that removes angular momentum from the star. And they're stuck here in the C branch rotating uh, very fast and not losing angular. But this mode is a metastable, that's why the name metastable dynamo model. So this is a metastable, not a, not a very stable mode for the dynamo. And then what happens is that um, spontaneously, randomly, and permanently, they transition, they decay, you could think of it as a decay, to the more, more stable mode, which is a mode that is coupled to the wings. And then they start to lose angular momentum in a much more efficient way transitioning to, to this branch. So I did mention that this gap is not populate, not very populated in the observations of, of open clusters, so we expect the transition to be a very fast one. And so, so I say that it's a unified spin down scenario because all stars spin down according to the same prescription that is this one. And the difference between one mode and the other is just the coupling constant that changes 
by uh, a factor of 100 at least. And so it gives you uh, a difference in the efficiency of amyloid momentum loss that is pretty big. And that transition, again, it's just a, a transition probability. It's not a deterministic, the time at which it happens for each star is not, it's not deterministic, but it's a transition probability that depends on the stellar mass. However, what this model is lacking is a good physical basis for which a reason for why these two, model, these two modes exist and, and what's, what's happening behind it. Our focus is as well, just like Brown's, on the angular momentum loss, and in particular, we'll focus on what determines the angular momentum loss, that is, the magnetic fields of the surface of the star. So this will determine the wind structure and, and, and the way and the rate at which angular momentum is lost. So we want to ask three questions. First, um, is the spatial resolution of the magnetic maps that are available good enough? So the available magnetic maps that from, the, from the surface of the stars are obtained using a semen Doppler imaging technique that provides us with uh, only large-scale magnetic fields. And so we want to see that we're, we're missing all the small structure, and we want to see how this small structure impacts the results and if this is reliable enough. Then we want to see uh, uh, along the same lines, because we're, we're familiar with the fact that uh, solar-type stars have active regions, it's very common, and so we want to see, again, how this Big concentrations of flux in small in small areas can affect the results. And finally, we ask how the large scale background morphology uh, affects the results. So, is it the same to model a dipole, a quadrupole? How does it? How does does angular momentum loss and mass loss depend on on the on the magnetic morphology of the large scale field? So, for these. We use uh, so we, we run with these magnetic maps, uh, three-dimensional simulations using um, an MHD model called Batsaras that gives a physics-based and uh, self-consistent acceler uh, acceleration of the wind, and it starts at, at the chromosphere and it, it hits the corona via alpha wave turbulence. So our input are the magnetic maps that go as a boundary condition at the, st at the stellar surface. And then our out output are the steady state three-dimensional solution that gives us all the, all the physical, important physical quantities that we need to, to calculate mass and angular momentum loss. So we start by the first question. Oops. <coughs> And to address that question, what we did was to develop a method to increase the resolution of the CDI magnetic maps, um, conserving the flux, and we used the Sun as a laboratory because we had low and high resolution observations for the Sun. And then we run the, the models and we get the three-dimensional uh, steady-state solutions and we compare the, the wind um, morphology and the X-ray morphology of the solution. And what we find is that, that uh, even though the wind structure doesn't dramatically change when, when including the small scale structure, what does change uh, significantly is the X-ray morphology. What I'm showing here is the two bottom plots are the ones that I just showed you, the corresponding to these two magnetograms, that are the low resolution magnetogram and this is the artificially increased resolution in the grams. These are the outputs of the model. And this is the output of the model for a, for a magnetogram that is high resolution and is observed from the sun. And this is a real X-ray observation of the sun. And what we see is that, the, that this one does much better than this one. So in, including introducing the small scale structure um, gets us to get the active regions to be more resolved, and mainly it increases the X-ray flux uh, by 150. This is 150% more than this one, and it still doesn't reach the observations, but it's in the right direction. And because X-ray is a good proxy for, for closed loops and, and magnetic flux in the closed loops, we think that what's happening, this is an indication that, that what's happening with the small scale is that it's closing open loops, or, or increasing the flux in the, in the closed loops. 
On the second question, we take observations of the active regions of the sun as well. And we, so we run our models for the, these active regions with an underlying dipolar field, and we shift them also in latitude. And we analyze these three parameters, the background um, field strength of the dipole, the field strength of the, the magnetic flux from the active regions, and the, and the latitude. And after analyzing all the parameters, we, we find that, that what matters really is the latitude of the spots, and that these, these, two, these two limiting cases are uh, illustrative of the qualitative results that are. So this plot is a, it's the typical wind structure of a dipole. And this is with the, magnet, with the magnetic active regions in the low latitudes, and this is with the magnetic active regions in the high latitudes. So what we find is that what really matters is if you if you have magnetic active regions in the otherwise open field line areas, because it has the capacity, they, they have the capacity of closing field lines. Well, when you when the magnetic active regions are in the dead zone, they don't they cannot close any field line. So these leads to the, the reduction of, uh, a reduction because of closing the field lines, the, the plasma cannot escape. And you get a reduction of mass loss and angular momentum loss. I'm showing here mass and angular momentum loss. Okay, that means I have to have that. Okay, so the, the difference in one case and the other is about a factor of three or four. And this could happen even in a magnetic cycle of the star that if the, if the magnetic active regions would Across the latitude at which the transition latitude that I showed, then the angular momentum loss would drop probably at two or three. However, let me emphasize on one thing: that high and low latitude here is really what, what really matters is open or closed field line areas. But it happens to be for a dipole that that corresponds to high or or low latitude. But that's not necessarily the case for other morphologies. Actually. Uh, an increased number of CDI observations uh, show that for younger stars, the magnetic, the magnetic, uh, the surface magnetic fields are much more complex, and that they store a big part or a big fraction of the magnetic flux in higher order magnetic uh, moments. And that's an example of a CDI observation of a young star, and we're looking at it from above the North Pole, and the solid line is the equator. Anyway, you can see that this is hardly dipolar, and that's that's a trend for a younger star. So what we do is we take the multipolar expansion and we study, uh, we run our models for the ten first terms in the multipolar expansion. So just the spherical harmonics mainly, and our results are shown in this plot. Where this is mass loss and this is angular momentum loss. And against multiple order. So each one of these is one of our simulations. This is a dipole, quadrupole, octopole, and magnetic complexity increases uh, towards the right. And this is a lower scale. And the different colors are just different field strengths that we explored, 10, 20, and 100 Gauss. And what we find is that both mass loss and angular momentum loss rates get rapidly suppressed with uh, magnetic complexity. And also we can see that the angular momentum loss is, is more sensitive to it, it's, it drops faster, and this is just because mass loss is one ingredient uh, in angular momentum loss, and there's others, for example, at what latitude the mass is being lost, if it's being lost in the poles, you don't remove any angular momentum at all, and that's one of the reasons is that for a dipole, this is the wind flux, the meridional head of a wind flux of a dipole simulation, and most of the mass is lost around the dead zones, so the open field line areas that wrap the dead zone are the ones carrying the most mass. And so for a dipole, it's uh, dominantly equatorial, the, the loss. However, as we go to higher complexity, these dead zones get all distributed in latitude and, and so the mass loss is, is, is less dominated equatorially. And that's the second factor to play. The third factor is that the alpine surface gets much smaller with, with 
magnetic complexity as of the lever R is smaller too. Okay, but looking at these results, what we mainly see is that more complex magnetic morphologies that according to the observation should correspond to, to younger stars um, lose angular momentum in a much less efficient way. This is three orders of magnitude less. And so that is reminiscent of Brown's scenario, especially because the difference even is, is, is similar to, to Brown's difference between the two coupling constants that had to be bigger than 100. And so what we propose is that the, the two modes of Brown are really just the magnetic complexity of the, of the, of the stellar surface field. And so we propose a new scenario by which stars, when they're very young, have very complex magnetic morphologies and therefore very inefficient uh, way of losing angular momentum and therefore they're staying uh, rapidly spinning and not able to lose their angular momentum until this magnetic complexity is eroded and then they rapidly transition to the efficient angular momentum loss mode. And that rapid transition in our, in our scenario just shows the steep dependence of angular momentum loss with magnetic order. And so this gives a, physic, a physical base to Brown's model. Uh, however, one could argue, right, we still don't understand why the dynamo works in such a way that, that gives the, the, the complexity at the surface of the star changes with age. Um, so we need to understand that better. But given the observations telling us that that's the way it works, this naturally arises just from the, the complexity seen in the observations. And it's also compatible with observations by Brian Wood, where he found that uh, for, for a couple of very active stars, the mass, the, the mass loss rates are two orders of magnitude smaller than one would expect. So that could be also because of magnetic complexity being, being uh, more in the active star. So I think uh, I will leave you with the conclusion and we'll go through it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a little time for questions. Yes. It's so, yes. This, this is really fascinating, especially the, the morphology part. Um, I wonder uh, when you take your multiple maps, what would happen if you added the extra artificial small scale structure like did for the solar case? I wonder if that would sort of soften the dependence or maybe increase it even. So the, the, so the small scale, the, the difference that it makes is negligible compared to, to the large scale uh, complexity. We see that the drop is very fast in, in the complexity of this large scale field and it's by orders of magnitude. Well, for the small scale, we couldn't even see a lot of difference in the wing itself. We just saw that probably because of the X-rays observations that we get, there's more close field areas. But we expect it to be of the order or even less than with the magnetic active regions, which was just two or a factor two or three. So it's much less than than that. That's certainly interesting. Maybe including um, mixed polarity. It's about that. Uh, it seems like you could uh, test this by looking at the sun, which goes through a change from more or less dipole to more minimal to bimolar to more massive. And as, I, as far as I know, there's a big change in the solar energy. But uh, so uh, the sun is still a uh, dipole with a magnetic active region, right? It's not so much of a. Okay, but, but does it look like a, something organized, like a quadrupole or. Okay, so, sorry, last question, Scott. It's, this is another sort of predictive question. There, so the, there's a prediction of this model that is different from the Brown model because you don't actually predict the binary shift. You kind of say, I'm going to go from a uh, particle of a uh, value of 8 to 4 to 2. And something like that, so if you go to the next slide after this, the one right before the end, that you should leave the C track relatively slowly and accelerate 
towards the eye track because the braking should be becoming more efficient as you get up there. Right. Do you this... have a way of, is there a predictive power in this model where you can basically look at one of those tracks and say this is populated correctly? Let me go back to this one okay. to give you an answer. So what we say is that K, the coupling constant in models, in, in Brown's model, is actually a function and not a, right. not a bimodal thing, not a coupling constant at all, but a function of, of complexity. But what gives you the answer, shows us that it could look bimodal, is that this is a very steep decrease by orders of magnitude. So if you have a very complex morphology, as soon as you get a 10% or a fraction, a very small fraction organized in a dipole, because usually you have a combination, right, in multiple expansion, you don't have only one of the orders. As soon as you get some kind of a dipole, the rest will be negligible. So it will give you like a bimodal flip kind of thing, because you get two orders. Yeah, you just need a dipole. Thank you very much.